desperate efforts to reach people stranded in mountain areas in Morocco. After its worst earthquake in more than a century, the scale of the disaster is still not fully known. So, does the country have what it needs to cope? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohamed Jamjoum. People in Morocco are rallying together after a catastrophic earthquake struck their country. The numbers of dead and injured run into the thousands, with the lives of many upended. Entire villages have been flattened, thousands of buildings toppled, and whole communities left homeless. The country faces a huge rebuilding challenge, but the immediate and most urgent task is reaching people cut off by the disaster. Hashem Ahil Barra is in a remote village where rescuers are searching for survivors in the rubble. This is one of the areas severely affected by the earthquake in the village of Wirgan. There were many, many casualties here. And the frantic search for people still trapped under the rubble is underway. People say that there are about three people still trapped here. And I just got to give you an idea about the delicate task I had for the security forces is they have to bring in excavators all the way to this area. The rescuers are looking for any chance to get into the void of a structure before they can decide whether they can send the stiff dogs and then their own people to try to retrieve people from under the rubble. There were about 30 people who died here. It's an extremely difficult situation uh, for the people, for those who lost their loved ones those who are looking forward to see whether they can find people under the rubble and those who are desperate to know how life will look like in the near future. For Inside Story, Hashim al Barra, the village of Wirgan, south of Marrakesh. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our guests. In Marrakesh is Amanda Mutaki, a volunteer in her community and also for the Amal Women's Training Center. In Dublin is Hassan Limtouni. He runs a cafe in Dublin and is a Moroccan community leader in Ireland. And in Jeddah is Martin Mai, earthquake scientist and professor of geophysics at King Abdullah University. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Amanda, let me start with you today. You are there on the ground in Marrakesh. I want to ask you about how much fear there is still among the residents of Marrakesh. We hear these reports of people that are afraid to go back into their homes, that are still sleeping outside. What is the current situation, and what is the level of fear right now? Sure. I think um, in the first couple of days, of course, it was very intense. Um, and I do think that the fear is subsiding a little bit now as people are just really um, moving towards relief efforts. Um, but uh, I also think there is a lot of people who are now starting to worry about can they actually get back into their homes, you know, structurally, if there's any damage, if there's any cracking, like, you know, just making sure that everything is safe and in place. So that's kind of the fear now for people who do have had damage. Just when can they get back in and when will it be safe for them to do that? And Amanda, if I can follow up with you, from your vantage point, what are the biggest challenges that the country faces right now in the scale of this, of this rescue effort? And, and what has the response been thus far? I think the biggest challenges is really just reaching the very remote, remote villages that were remote when there is no natural disaster, but now when there is this added, you know, disaster with limited roads and roads that are blocked and, and all of that, just, you know, reaching those. But um, I feel like there's been so much mobilization and there is progress being made as fast as they can. Um, it's been really, um, that, you know, great to see how fast that that has happened. Um, of course, as much as, you know, there's always a need for more, but it's been very quick. Um, and then I think just grappling with, you know, what does this mean for the rest of the country? Because as, you know, these areas are, are definitely affected. There are other areas of the country that are completely unaffected, um, but are seeing the trickle-down effects as, um, you know, the country just has to pool all of its resources to this one area. Hassan, uh, from your perspective, you're there in Dublin. You're a member of the diaspora. Um, uh, from where you're sitting, what has the response been thus far from the diaspora, from those Moroccans who live in other parts of the world who want to help? Well, I think it's it's been kind of like, you know, everyone is under this 
that first shock of you know to see this the devastation that's that that's that took place and i think um everyone is trying to all gather together and do and think about the this first um, first wave that the, the help is coming from uh, all different directions and i think you know um from our side we're going to be talking to some of our uh, my fellow moroccans to, to to see like in, in the long run to establish something that 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 would go beyond just you know let's get rid of the rubbles and things because a lot of these people that they've been displaced and a lot of these villages say i grew up in marrakesh and i've been to a lot of these places and just to see how much is it gonna take to even uh, bring something back to uh, bring total life or to, to 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 help them to to regroup and to recuperate like some of what what, what the losses which is you know and I, I can even imagine being in those situations my heart and our goals through you know to them and the the people that that died and gone God you know larham home and uh, so we want to do something in the long run. To, to bring them to bring prosperity to them that's that's really the goal and we're going to try to do as much as we can to do that uh, hassan it seems to me you're talking about trying to set up some type of infrastructure going forward so that the people who need aid the most who need help the most it's ensured that they would get that i, I want to ask you as somebody who is outside of morocco right now do you think that needs to be done more with the help of the international community? Is it something that needs to be done more within Morocco? I mean, how do you go about trying to set something like that up? Well, uh, first, like to just to be like more to, you know, like there is there is a great love for Morocco and Moroccans in Ireland to begin with. You know, it's, it's a country that it's known for like its its generosity and its you know help for 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 the needy outside you know anywhere in the most the most uh, areas and then there's a combination of that and a combination of there is some organizations there's one in in Marrakesh that it's you know the uh, a line international that they do reach out to a lot of these villages even before this disaster they used to go in the winters and take blankets and foods and certain things out to them so i think uh, that that will be the starting point is the awareness a lack of how to 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 spread the word. This is how how we can help and get in touch with organizations that they're already in place in in Morocco, like and that in Marrakesh, or that they can they have access to communities, the small communities that they were affected. And I think that would be the most effective way of you know uh, of moving forwards. So it'd be a combination of you know. Uh, starting from Ireland as well and connecting that and there is the the our uh Moroccan ambassador Monsieur Lehsen is 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 one of the most amazing human beings here that did so much for like to 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 mm. to to bring the, the relationship between Morocco and Ireland so mm. that, that I will have I'm going to reach out to the Moroccan embassy and will through all that whatever we can do mm. to rebuild and to help these people We'll do it because everything that we need to do, you need to be baby stepping it into making it more of a real thing and it reach the people that needs to reach. So that's really the goal. Martin, there's been a lot of shock that this happened in Morocco. I want to ask you how unusual it is that an earthquake uh, of this magnitude hit Morocco and, and how does this earthquake compare to other earthquakes uh, in the region and around the world in recent years? Um, well, good afternoon, first of all, and uh, I initially want to express my deep condolences to the people of Morocco and all the people affected there and pay my highest respects to the rescue forces and rescue squads out there that um, do an amazing job now to pull people still from the rubble and help. Um, so your question is a very good one. Um, uh, Morocco has had severe earthquakes in the past. In 1960, Agadir was hit by a magnitude 5.8 or 9 earthquake that killed about 12,000 people. And in 2004, further up to the north, there was an earthquake in uh, Hokema that killed a bit more than 600 people. That means, uh, you know, earthquakes do occur in Morocco and in, the, in, in, this, in this region in the High Atlas, although not very frequently. And that is attributed to 
the rate of plate motion and the accumulation of geologic stresses in the region. Um, uh, in Algeria, uh, Algeria, there was a big earthquake in the 1970s that also killed thousands of people. So it's not uncommon, but it's relatively infrequent if you compare, let's say, with Japan or New Zealand or uh, Chile, other countries that are more often hit by large earthquakes. And Martin, you so were that's also the first point. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Right. And, and so if, if we think back, uh, your second part of the question was other earthquakes globally uh, in the recent past. Uh, magnitude 6.8 is fairly large, but of course we all have in our memories the earthquakes of Turkey, uh, Turkey and northern Syria in uh, February this year. They were much larger. Um, they were 7.8 and 7.6. And so we cannot quite compare what happened in Morocco with what happened in uh, in uh, Turkey. Nevertheless, people are affected strongly. The, uh, many lost their lives, many lost their, their, their houses and, uh, and um, how to make a life. So the tragedy is essentially the same. It is, uh, you know, people are greatly, greatly affected and greatly scared of, the, of those who are on site. Martin, you were talking before about some of the characteristics in this particular earthquake, things like rate of plate motion, uh, as you mentioned. I want to ask you if mm -hmm. there are characteristics in this specific earthquake in Morocco that make it different uh, than other earthquakes from what you've seen thus far. Yeah, so uh, that, that's an excellent question. So first of all, we, uh, from the scientific side, we only began to accumulate the data and the information to make more in-depth analysis. Um, there are what, what I would call preliminary um, uh, explanations and physical models of what really happened during that earthquake. The United States Geological Survey has published already something that allows us to understand a little bit better what happened. Um, so, in, in, in rough terms, the earthquake occurred on a what we call a south dipping fault under the high atlas. It spanned an area in deep in the earth about 50 kilometers in length and 30 kilometers in depth. So it's a very large area over which that rupture happened. And um, the, two play, uh, the two fault sides moved by several meters against each other in just a few seconds. And so that releases the sudden release of the stress mm. creates the seismic waves. Now, that is nothing unusual compared to what we know of earthquakes over the last decades uh, globally. So that earthquake shows same, very similar features of what we know from other earthquakes of that magnitude uh, in mm. the past. Uh, Amanda, uh, you were speaking earlier uh, and Hassan was speaking earlier uh, mm -hmm. about the concern for those in the hardest hit areas, uh, in those very remote areas. Uh, we, we've heard and, and seen reports that residents uh, in villages in the high Atlas Mountains have been calling on people from Marrakesh and from other cities to come and help them. Uh, first, I want to ask you, are there volunteers from the cities going to those areas or trying to make it to those areas? And also, I want to ask you, has aid actually started reaching those areas? There's been a massive, massive outpouring of aid and um, people that, you know, if they can drive, they drive up as far as they can. Um, if there are other ways to get there, there's helicopters of aid that are going up. Um, so they definitely are getting out there. But I think like it's, it's good to think about it geographically, right? Like you have Marrakesh, which is like a very, very large city, right? And then up into the mountains as you go, there's, there's large, bigger cities and villages, and then they get smaller and smaller and smaller down to like, very small, you know, family compound size that might only be 20 or 30 members, but they're like really remote in the mountains. Um, and so it's those villages that are really remote that um, are struggling to get hit, right? So the aid gets to the bigger village and then to the small, you know, and then it works its way up. Um, so it's uh, going to take a little bit of time, but uh, it seems like every hour, every couple of hours, um, more news comes out that, you know, another village has been reached, another village has been re reached. And, you know, definitely we saw this today, this morning, that um, the Moroccan military aid was airdropping supplies um, out of the helicopters to some of those more remote villages. So there is definitely work underway to get to them. Um, it's just a matter of how, how long it will take to reach those really remote um, communities. Hassan, from what you've seen uh, thus far, do you think that the international community is doing enough 
to aid those most in need, uh, not just in the cities, but also in the remote areas. It's just a waiting game. And like, how, how, how do you clear, you clear the paths to, to reach one village and then you clear the paths to, 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 reach, to reach the next one? I think that's really the only thing, you know, that can be done, regardless if you have international help or not. I mean, they will move with the same kind of, because it seems that the government has, you know, they have, uh, things in control and the countries that they are mm. uh, called to help, they are helping. And and I think there will be more help needed down the road. And I think that's 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 really what I feel like. That's, mm. you know, once you actually reach these people, the help is, the, the, the that's really going to be needed from the international community and from everyone else is mm. uh, the aftermath. Like, you know, and what happened in Turkey and Syria, like before. So uh, we need to take a, a, a page out of that and go, we need to go further. We need to help these people kind of move, regroup, and mm -hmm. do, you know, help them as much as we can down the roads, you know, Hasn not just the immediate one. Hassan, let, let me also ask you, how tight-knit is the Moroccan community uh, in Ireland and, and there where you are in Dublin? Um, and, and, you know, what have the efforts been like thus far, as far as the outpouring of support you're seeing from the Moroccan community there? Well, I think a lot of them, you know, reaching out to their families, close loved ones, and trying to, because it's, it's, this is all like a fresh, event, you know, sort of an event that just happened, you know, that's, and everyone is trying to, to piece it together and see what they can do. Some of them already donated money through different channels. Some of them uh, are asking, taking notes of what, what needs to be done. And, and I think, you know, we would, we will reach out to each other and see what will be like the most effective way of, of, of helping so like our, every individual kind of the, the focus is to 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 kind of make sure that your family your people do you know the immediate people you know and then you then you move into like what what can we do to help the people we don't know that they're far enough and so I think that's what uh, what that's where that's where we're at right now so like we mm. try to organize something that would be you know um, more effective. Uh, Martin, you mentioned before uh, some of the past earthquakes in Morocco. You talked about the earthquake in, in 1960. And I, and I wanted to ask you about the fact that that earthquake in 1960 in Morocco, that led to changes in construction rules and in building regulations in Morocco. Uh, from, from what you've seen thus far in the reporting in the aftermath of this earthquake uh, in Morocco, the structures that have been built in these very remote and rural areas, especially in the, in the high Atlas Mountains, I mean, have they been built? Uh, in a way that they could withstand such tremors? We must not forget that many of these buildings are probably older than 1960 or built shortly after. And so these rules, uh, a new building code might have been in place, but not necessarily applied yet to these structures. And in particular, if we look at um, the classic building style of uh, mud brick housing, um, so these uh, adobe constructions with uh, wooden uh, reinforcement in between, um, which is the traditional building style, um, that obviously is not, uh, you know, according to modern earthquake safety standards. About uh, my... houses that have been built, yeah. I I'm sorry, go ahead. I did not mean to interrupt you. No, I mean, and then, I mean, more recent housing that's maybe, uh, you know, some, some breaks or some concrete. Um, what really matters is that this is reinforced internally. Um, and so if this has not happened, then, of course, the buildings are more vulnerable than, than they uh, should be. Well, Martin, let, let me ask you this. Uh, Morocco is a, is a poor country, relatively speaking. Um, how can a country mitigate against this kind of a thing when it comes to trying to protect structures against earthquakes? Yeah, that's that, that's a very good question. And it actually it turns out that, you know, uh, building seismically safe is not necessarily very expensive, in particular for residential housing, for schools, if it's just a single floor or maybe two floors. And in fact, there are there are actually techniques that um, are used, for instance, in Nepal that experienced a very large earthquake in 2015. Um, but even before that, in which they retrofit existing buildings uh, and schools with very simple methods and just reinforcing the buildings from the outside with cross braces and things like that. 
And so there are both ways to build, of course, um, from scratch in, in a relatively seismically safe way, but also to retrofit houses in with, with uh, local resources and local skills uh, accordingly, if you have the respective programs in place, so to and, speak. And, and let me ask you, um, how expensive would that kind of an undertaking be and what kind of expertise would be needed? Oh, I, I can't comment on expenses. I simply don't know because it depends on, you know, where you source the local materials and how many buildings you have to retrofit and what their status is. So that this is something I cannot really comment on. Um, in terms of, of the skills of the local workers, I, I think that is not too difficult. And in fact, um, I, I, there is an NGO in, in California that works with the local population and trains the local engineers, in this case, and specifically in Nepal, and I think also in the Philippines, to build the buildings or to retrofit the existing schools and residential housing with the local uh, materials and with the local engineers um, to make it uh, fast, relatively fast, efficient, and in particular, affordable for the local population. So it can be done. Um, it is really an educational aspect that, um, that makes the difference. Uh, Amanda, I saw you nodding along to some of what Martin was mm -hmm. saying there, and it looked like you wanted to jump in, so I'm going to go ahead and let you do that. No, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, traditionally built houses here are built um, in the traditional way, like you said, with mud bricks, um, and a lot of these, you know, communities out, out there are built, um, you know, using their traditional techniques and their traditional building ways. Um, that are not only for earthquakes, but also to withstand really severe winters. Um, and that's, you know, so you have a complex number of things that they're trying to deal with, which is, you know, snow, cold, uh, rain, torrential rain at times, plus now earthquakes and all of these other um, possibilities. So it, um, there's a lot, just a lot to take into consideration there. Amanda, let me also ask you about the fact that um, when an earthquake like this hits, there is obviously a lot of psychological trauma. Uh, and I want to ask you how much concern there is amongst uh, your community and the volunteers uh, with regard to the kind of psychological impact this will have for survivors. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we're quite having those conversations yet. Uh, some people are talking about it, um, and it sways from people who don't want to talk about it at all to people who that's all that they talk about, right? Um, and I think that that's natural after um, some a traumatic event happens. Um, I also hope that there is some effort put into how to handle children um, who are who have, you know, have gone through this um, and who are now, you know, fearful and afraid and possibly have, you know, lost their families. Um, but, you know, for the survivors, as much aid comes in and, and as much as the death toll mounts, you know, for the, the people who've survived and the people who have, um, will now have to rebuild, whether that's, you know, their livelihoods, their houses, their, you know, their lives in general, um, that's also important, I guess. Um, and I feel like can sometimes be lost in the, you know, in the numbers. Uh, Amanda, uh, you also mentioned earlier uh, some of the, the logistical challenges uh, that, that uh, aid workers and, and other volunteers are, are facing right now. And I want to ask you more specifically about that. I mean, how difficult mm -hmm. is it specifically to get medical aid, to get uh, food uh, to these very remote areas? Mm -hmm. What are some of the real challenges right now that people are facing in trying to get mm -hmm. to these places? I mean, I think the biggest challenge is that there are not that many roads um, in, in general that go up into these areas. You know, there's some villages that even in good times are only accessible by mule or by foot. Um, and so those areas are hard to get. And then if the roads that you're using to get there are blocked from, from you know, landslides or from, you know, just boulders that are in the way, um, you have to get the equipment there to move those things. And that means a lot of the equipment is down here, you know, you know, 30, 40, 50 kilometers or more away. Um, so imagine having to move an excavator, you know, 50 or 80 kilometers up into the mountain uh, just to get to start moving these rocks. Um, that's logistically difficult. So I think it's just getting those accessible roads and those accessible pathways and then using air support where possible. Um, and there's not a lot of landing space either for helicopters, right? So if you're flying helicopter aid in, there's not a lot of flat spaces for them to land. So they need to be able to airdrop or um, 
figure out another way to either you know bring aid down or to lift out people who've been injured. Uh, Hassan, um, from your vantage point, how difficult will reconstruction will reconstruction efforts be? Well, I think it's going to be extremely um, difficult to, to 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 do that, and um, um, and I think you know, like both of the you know, the, the people like earlier, like Martin, and they're talking about like the to act, to to rethink the way you you always built like your traditional way of building your 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 homes and things of that sort and schools and that so your uh, new infrastructure has to be has to be we figured again because you know if if this comes again then you will you'll be at least prepared then you would have less of what what the damages that have been that that we're experiencing right now and uh, the other thing is the is the uh, the, the the help like that's 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 uh, to have the the the, the fund and the, the the people that would educate you and then uh, uh, about how to to rebuild you know your 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 home mm. uh, and it'd be safer in the future and the other thing that's 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 I mean, was talking about the psychological parts I think that is really like that is the the effect that that would be um, especially for children and as mm. we see like like a lot of a lot of the kids that they lost their loved ones and uh, and and mm. then uh, they they're dis they're going to be displaced so where are they going to go so there's like another thing that that has to be uh, uh, taken in consideration to to see where are these kids going to go like and for their education for their things and you know. Um, so that's a, that's another challenge. All right, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Amanda Mutaki, Hassan Lemtouni, and Martin Mai. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Mjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.